Energy, I'm Emily Chang. All this week, Bloomberg Television and Radio are on the ground in Boston, showcasing tech giants and startups, plus breakthrough technologies in the fields of biotech and robotics. We are speaking with innovators, venture capitalists, educators who've all laid roots across the city. Our Caroline High joins us now live from GE's interim headquarters in Boston. Caroline, what do you got on tap for today? So much, Emily. Thank you. I've had such an awesome week here so far, spending time in your old haunt, Harvard University yesterday, and of course the Museum of Science the day before. Today, GE kind enough to host us in their interim headquarters. Now you'll recall, of course, GE announced its relocation from Connecticut to Boston in January of last year, bringing hundreds of jobs to the local area while receiving up to $145 million worth of incentives and tax breaks from the state of Massachusetts and the city of Boston. Now, just on Monday, GE broke ground on their new headquarters, less than half a mile away from where we are right now. Here's CEO Jeff Immelt at the event. I think Boston should look to the future with great uh, promise and with great uh, 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 optimism. I, I really believe that this town is going to be one of the most important cities in the world and that GE can be part of that renaissance, whether it's in technology or manufacturing or innovation. For more on GE's grand plans for the city of Boston, we're joined by the company's chief financial officer, Jeff Bornstein. Wonderful. Thank you for having us. Thank you for coming. You've settled in well. And this is going to be where the digital team is going to be sitting. That's it's right. still a bit of work under construction. But mm -hmm. therefore, to speak to us about what Boston means for your own digital transformation in the business. Well, I think that Boston is very unique. First of all, you start with a place where there's more R&D and research spent per capita than any other place in the world. Boston is a, a just a bed of ideas and a sea of ideas, meaning there is so, such an entrepreneurial spirit here. There's so many startups. There's such a deep technology culture here um, that it's, it's absolutely the right place for us to start making this transformation. Uh, no question about it. And listen, there's no other place on, on earth where you've got 500,000 of the smartest kids in the world going to school and graduating every year in the metro Boston area. So Boston is really, really unique in that regard. And, and I, we are absolutely thrilled to be here and to be a part of this ecosystem. Your conglomerate among so many areas, power, aviation, where do you think will make the most obvious indent in terms of the digital transformation to your business? Where will we start to see being invigorated quickly? Well, I, we think it plays horizontally across all of our verticals. Um, Clearly in healthcare, there's an enormous amount you can do with AI and machine learning and how we think about clinical outcomes around images. Our oil and gas business is plowing full steam ahead on uh, improving productivity and efficiency of wells and trying to get the break-even price per barrel of oil or MMBTU of gas down uh, for our customers to make our products more competitive. So I don't think there's a business in the GE portfolio that is not going to benefit dramatically from this digital transformation. And, and at the end of the day, we're trying to make our products through analytics and data perform better for customers to create better outcomes for our customers economically. And we think there's an enormous amount of productivity in the world's installed base of machines or systems of machines. We've seen you actually make quite a bit of acquisition activity, particularly in the area of robotics, 3D printing, I'm thinking yeah. of. They have been targeted largely at European companies, but what about the acquisition opportunities here in Boston and, and the East Coast area, yeah. and to continue to build out that part of the business? So there's no question in our mind that additive manufacturing is an, an enormous opportunity for the company and for the world, and, and it'll be every bit as revolutionary as what will happen in the digital transformation in the industrial internet. We absolutely believe that. Um, we, we bought two big uh, concept labor at RCAM, two big uh, laser printing companies in, in Europe last year. But that's not, we didn't start there. We started with an acquisition of a company called Morris Technologies right here in the U.S. about five years ago. And that got us going. And we've been investing and in doing an enormous amount of research around 3D printing or additive manufacturing over that period of time. So we didn't just start with these acquisitions. These acquisitions give us new modalities of technology and allow you to make parts differently in different kinds of parts. And we'll continue to invest in, and leverage off that. But it is going to completely remake how people think about designing products or parts or finished product. 
uh, and how they build it. You know, the great thing about additive, it's a constructive process, not destructive. So, you know, you only use the material you need to make the product, and you can make it in a fidelity that you could never do with today's machine technology. There's just, the greatest machines in the world today won't let you make things as intricately as 3D printing. So it opens up a design space that's really never, ever existed. You say you didn't start with those acquisitions. Do you finish with them? Are there more to come? We're, no, we're always going to continue to reevaluate how we put this puzzle together and whether there's opportunities to, to move the ball farther down the field and accelerate. We'll, 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 we're wide open, and, and Boston fits that way, too. We have partnerships with Mass Robotics and yeah. uh, a deep relationship with MIT Labs, a deep relationship with Northeastern's Labs, where there's a lot of 3T printing research going on. Uh, both in metals and fibers, and and so there's a real ecosystem here to move the to, to move the the whole practice forward. You're talking about investment and money spending, and I know you're a man who's got to look at yeah. cost cutting at the same time. Yeah. I can't have a CFO in front of me without asking. How are you able to square that circle? Because of course you've been asked to keep, take two billion dollars out of the operations. How, yeah. how are you achieving that? Well, this is about the future, so we, we have to continue to invest in the future. This is this is where the company is going for the next decade, two decades. So. In the long run, these are the kinds of investments we have to make. At the same time, we've got to run our own company currently as efficiently as possible. And, and so we can do this. We can walk and chew gum. We can do the, the, the One doesn't have to be at the expense of the other. As a matter of fact, I think running the company more efficiently today gives us the opportunity to invest in these technologies that are really going to be the future of the company for the next 10 or 20 years. And as you make these big commitments, these big investments, rehoming yourself at a time of political change, how do you feel that the political environment fits in with this? You talk about talent pool, what Boston brings to you. Well, mm. there's worries about immigration coming from some of those leading institutions. Mm. There's worries about some of the funding perhaps going into biotech, which is the lifeblood of Boston. Mm. What do you think about the, the Trump administration in that respect? Well, I don't have specific comments around the Trump administration. I think from a GE perspective, we're a global company. We serve uh, global customers. We have a global workforce. And that's the company we are, and that's the company we're going to run. So fortunately, we have a wide, you know, our supply chain, our manufacturing and technology capability looks like the places and the customers we serve. Um, and, and that's how we have to run the company. And we're a global company. We're going to remain a, a global company. Um, I think anything we do policy-wise in the U.S. that makes the U.S. more attractive for investment. Taxes taxes and improves the competitiveness of the U.S., I think is great for GE and great for other U.S. companies. But we still, more than 50 percent of what we do and sell, we do outside the U.S. And so we've got to be able to play broadly globally. And consider that digital transformation globally as well. It's been great having you here. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for you. homing us for Not the day. Wonderful to have welcome. Jeff Bornstein, CFO of General Electric, or GE, of course, is yeah. how they want to be known. Now, a story we're watching for you. Shares of Snap tumbled more than 20% in Thursday's trading session. Investors sold the stock on disappointing first quarter results and slowing user growth. But there are 13 buys and 17 hold ratings. A few sells out there too as well. But with an average price target of $21 a share, they could bounce back. RBC Capital, uh, RBC analyst, Mark Mahaney says Snap is already larger than Twitter in terms of daily active users and is more innovative. Now, coming up, we'll go under the hood of startup Newtonomy. How it's beating heavyweights like Uber and Lyft in the autonomous car race. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg Radio app, Bloomberg.com, and in the US on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology, live from GE's interim headquarters in Boston's Seaport District. Now, this area was designated as the city's innovation district back in 2010. This was part of an initiative to develop 1,000 acres of land to lure in companies and create new jobs. Now, the Seaport is now home to a number of tech startups, including autonomous vehicle technology startup startup Newtonomy. The company has launched a fleet of autonomous taxis in Singapore and has started to test out its technology on the mean streets of Boston. We were able to get in an inside look at Newtonomy's Boston headquarters and, well, check out what they are cooking up. Take a look. Mm -hmm. 
Self-driving technology is taking automakers and tech giants by storm globally. And Boston isn't sitting this one out. Newtonomy, a self-driving car startup, began testing here in January. Gretchen Efgin is VP of Partnerships. She previously worked at Cambridge-based Zipcar. Every major city is grappling with the largest human urban migration in history and trying to figure out how do we as cities accommodate this growing urban population without having to expand our infrastructure uh, at that same pace, which just isn't possible. So that's where autonomous vehicles can really be part of that solution. Last August in Singapore, Newtonomy teamed up with Southeast Asia's largest ride-hailing service, Grab, for the world's first public trial of autonomous driving taxis, beating higher-profile Uber to the punch. Grab is a known consumer brand, Newtonomy is a software brand, and so by partnering with Grab, we could reach a broader cross-section of the public. Headquartered in both Singapore and Massachusetts, the MIT spin-off was founded in 2013. The company recently moved its US offices from Cambridge to within the city's designated testing zone in Boston. Now, home to its employees and cars. Having the garage on site and being in the testing area also allows our developers to really see in real time the area that they're coding for and building the technology platform for. As for residents in Boston hailing self-driving taxis, It'll take some time uh, for us to get there. We're mapping the area and working with the city and MassDOT to roll that out. The startup is backed by Singapore's government, as well as Ford Motor Chairman Bill Ford. It has raised $20 million so far and is in talks for a new round of funding as Newtonomy works towards a full commercial launch in 2018. Now we're joined by Newtonomy CEO, Carl Yanyema. Wonderful to have you with us. And Carl, talk to us. First of all, how is the pilot going here in Boston and indeed in Singapore? Well, in Boston, you know, we just got on the road. We started driving here about a month and a half ago. And we're adapting our driving, our autonomous driving, to the streets of Boston. Boston's pretty different than Singapore. <laughs> Singapore, I can tell you, people obey the rules of the road. The infrastructure is perfect. No jaywalking. No jaywalking. Uh, Boston, people are a little bit more creative on the road. And so we have to adapt our software to really let the car drive more like a Bostonian. I want to understand where you fit in the whole ecosystem of self-driving cars, because is the idea that you, you're obviously partnering with auto manufacturers such as Renault, such as Peugeot, so you don't want to be making the cars. Is it about setting the technology to the car makers? What about the likes of Waymo and Uber? How are you working or, or competing? Well, there's a lot of companies out there that can build cars. Mm. And today, there's actually very few companies that can build the software that can power a self-driving car. So we're a software company. We believe that building the software is the most capital efficient way to create a lot of value in this space. We're partnering with car makers. We're going to integrate our software with their cars and then put these cars on the road in a ride hailing network. Mm. And so you'll be able to call one of our cars. It'll come pick you up and drop you off, just like a human pilot at taxi service. The difference is there'll be no one behind the wheel. And as a result, the cost of that service will be substantially lower than today's taxi services. So the revenue from the car trips will go to you, will be divided. How, have you decided how the revenue model will work? There'll be a revenue share there, but the fundamental difference is, you know, we're not going to be selling cars in the traditional automotive paradigm. We're going to be selling kilometers. You know, there were 10 trillion miles driven globally last year. We want to sell a significant fraction of those at a reasonable price per mile. And the data? Who owns the data? That's a great question. I mean, the data... We're learning, everybody's realizing the space, the data itself is a very valuable resource. We are collecting more data about the Boston cityscape at a level of precision you know, that's never been collected before. Mm. And so some of these questions are unanswered, but uh, there's a ton of potential for monetization of the data stream itself. So will the car companies own the data along with you? Because this is where the tussle has come in. I know Bill Ford, having spoken to him at the Web yeah. Summit a couple of years ago, was worried about well, if they don't own the data, then, then the likes of Google and Apple will eat their lunch. Again, it's a turf war at the moment. I mean, all good questions, open questions, those are negotiations that are to be had. Uh, but clearly, people are staking out their territory. Everybody's trying to sit as high in the value chain as they can, and we're no different. Talk to us about your talent pool here. Particularly, you came director at MIT, you founded out of MIT with an alliance with, with Singapore. And are you really, mu how much of your team is from 
those academic institutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got about one third of our company here in Boston, about two thirds in Singapore. I mean, we love being here in Boston. You've got MIT, you've got Harvard, Boston University, some of the best universities in the world. And uh, relatively speaking, we have, you know, let's say little competition in the automotive, the autonomous driving space. So we've got a great line on these extremely talented individuals. Mm. And the currency today in this space is really finding these very talented people. It's, uh, it's really a battle to recruit and land these folks. And the reason is that, you know, the difference between winning and losing the space solely comes down to the quality of your team. So we've got a hundred of the most talented autonomous vehicle engineers in the world, and that's really what sets us apart. It would come down to your team, and it might also come down to your funding. Are you close to closing your funding round at the moment, and, and how easy or tough has it been? Well, I can tell you that uh, there's enormous interest in, uh, in, in autonomous vehicles in general, and in what we're doing in particular. Access to capital uh, isn't really what keeps me up at night. You know, I okay, worry good. about getting the technology right, and uh, <laughs> if we can get that right, everything else will take care of itself. So money is coming in soon? It may be. It may be. We're working on it. We're always working on it. <laughs> We're glad that you are. And one piece of advice, therefore, to all the entrepreneurs who are looking to set up in Boston. Yes, this is the place to be, or do you need to be international, multinationalize yourself? Well, here in Boston, you know, we've got access to talent and you've got access to capital, as we've talked about. And those two ingredients are the lifeblood of any startup. So it's a great place to be. It's been great having you here as well with us. It's been a great week and a great day. And wonderful to have you with us in the GE Interim Headquarters. Newtonomy CEO, that was Carl Yanyama joining us there. Now coming up, we continue to go behind the scenes of big tech firms' operations in Boston. Up next, we're visiting Microsoft's Cambridge Lab. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to a special edition of Bloomberg Technology from Boston. All this week, we've been going behind closed doors, checking out the local operations of tech giants like Facebook and IBM. We also visited Microsoft's New England lab in Cambridge. The same week, the company holds its annual Build to Developer conference. So let's see how they fit into the bigger picture at the company. It's Microsoft's biggest event. Now in its seventh year, Microsoft Build is an annual conference designed for developers. And earlier this week, over 5,000 of them descended over Seattle to dream up the future of PCs, tablets, phones, gaming consoles, and AI innovation, like Cortana. Here are 10 Japanese restaurants in Seattle. Microsoft's Siri-like digital assistant announced at Build three years ago. AI is everywhere. At this year's main event, CEO Satya Nadella took to the stage to share his vision to make AI available to everyone, powered by the cloud. Furthering that commitment to bringing AI to everyone is this Microsoft Research's New England lab is at the forefront of machine learning research being conducted into healthcare, social media, economics and more. I travelled over 3,000 miles from San Francisco to Cambridge to visit the lab and sat down with Jennifer Chase, Managing Director of Microsoft Research New England. What we are doing is we have deep collaborations between people in AI and in, for example, economics and biomedical. This New England lab is part of a Microsoft Research community of more than 1,000 scientists and engineers across 11 different research labs. When I wrote up the pitch for Bill and Steve 10 years ago, it was precisely the expertise that was here. You attempt sort of to use either things like concentration and inequalities. This lab was aimed at bringing together computer science with the social sciences and the biomedical sciences. There are 50 universities within, you know, about a mile of us. And it was the ability to work closely with these universities. I don't think there's a researcher in our lab who hasn't had deep and impactful collaborations with the local expertise. That's also not going to be as good as the dystopians think. For more on the exciting projects happening here, I walked around with Matt Taddy, principal researcher of the lab. What we're trying to do is take a bunch of the things that economists do in their day to day, pricing, forecasting, competition analysis, things like that, and we want to automate those things and supercharge them with big data. You really need AI and machine learning 
to make the best use of their data and to increase the number of users and have those users be more satisfied. So depending on what you do, you could name almost any field for me and I could tell you how AI is going to really help that field to serve its customers better. Now, a story we're watching for you. Verizon is the winner in the bidding war with AT&T for airwave licenses holded, holder Straight Path. Now, it's agreed to buy the company for $3.1 billion in stock. Straight Path is one of the largest holders of Spectrum approved for 5G use. Both Verizon and AT&T have hopes to build the nation's leading 5G network. That would relieve congestion on older networks and help win customers looking for a lightning-fast internet connection. Now coming up, GE Ventures has dozens of companies in its portfolio covering healthcare, software and the enterprise business. We'll hear from the person running it all, GE Ventures CEO Sue Siegel. That's next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out, it's at Bloomberg Tech TV. Weekdays at 5 p.m. in New York and Boston, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. I'm Elisa Parenti in Washington, and you're watching Bloomberg Technology. Let's start with a check of your first word news. The vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee is accusing the White House of not taking the investigation into Russia and the election seriously. Senator Mark Warner of Virginia says the firing of former FBI Director James Comey will in no way deter the committee from finding out the truth of what happened during the 2016 presidential election. A new poll gives President Trump the lowest approval rating of his young presidency. Just 36 percent of people who responded to a Quinnipiac University poll say they approve of the job the president is doing. U.S.-backed Iraqi forces moved to surround Mosul's old city today, one week after launching a push to drive Islamic State militants from areas they still hold. That is according to an Iraqi officer. The operation to retake Mosul began in October. The city fell to Islamic State nearly three years ago. And South Korea's new president is trying to mend fences with China. Moon Jae-in told Chinese President Xi Jinping he's aware of concerns over a U.S. missile shield deployed in South Korea. In a phone call, Moon told Xi it may become easier to settle differences over the missile system if North Korea stops its provocations. Global News 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,600 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Elisa Parenti. This is Bloomberg. It's just after 5.30 p.m. Thursday here in Washington, already 7.30 Friday morning in Sydney. We are joined by Bloomberg's Paul Allen with a look at the markets. Good morning, Paul. Good morning, Elisa. Well, we're seeing ASX futures pointing down about a tenth of 1% to end the trading week here in Australia. Once again, keep an eye on banking stocks. been a tough week for the banks. Uh, a meeting between bank executives and Treasury officials on Thursday about this uh, new levy that the government intends to impose on the banks uh, ended uh, with more questions uh, uh, that raised more questions than answers uh, in terms of how that's going to be calculated. Uh, Nikkei futures uh, traded out of Chicago down about half a percent. Keep an eye on Nissan today, uh, forecasting a 7.7% drop in profit to about $6 billion on high raw material costs and a strong yen. A lot of earnings out of Japan as well today. Hitachi, Suzuki, Yamaha and Isuzu among them. Uh, in South Korea, an exciting day for Netmarble making its debut. The IPO raised $2.3 billion. That's more than LG's market cap. It is the biggest IPO in South Korea for seven years. So that is the big one to watch in the Asia Pacific today. I'm Paul Allen in Sydney. More from Bloomberg Technology next.
this is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Caroline Hyde in Boston. We've been visiting locations throughout the city all week, showcasing the innovation, the diversity, the power of the regional tech economy. We're currently at GE's interim headquarters in Boston. In the last hour, took a closer look at the investment in climate, investing climate in the city with, of course, GE's CFO, Jeff Bornstein. Now we're going to turn to the conglomerate's venture capital strategy. The company has invested in dozens of companies based in Boston and, well, throughout the globe, like Desktop Metal and Catalan, just to name a few. For more, we're now joined by Sue Siegel, CEO of GE Ventures, now sat in Los Angeles. But let's talk about Boston, Sue, because where are you finding the innovation? What companies already have you put money to work in? Yeah. So, Caroline, first of all, thank you for doing this and, and having us. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so GE Ventures is actually investing in a number of different spaces. We invest across our horizon as it relates to what GE is actually involved in. And so we're investing in healthcare, we're investing in energy, advanced manufacturing, and we're also investing in software. Some of the companies that we're excited to invest in are, for example, desktop metals. You heard earlier from our CFO, um, Jeff Bornstein, about how big of a bet that GE is making around this transformative uh, technology. And one of the things that we have done at GE Ventures and invest in a company called Desktop Metals, and it's a Boston-based company. We're really excited about the way it's democratizing and really transforming the way manufacturing is being done. And it's around a metal 3D printing technology. So that's just one of them, for example. Catalent is a company, you know, so many different business models have really emerged. And Catalent has taken the business model of marketplaces and essentially set it out there to find talent for what you might be looking for. It matches talent external in the external ecosystems and to internal needs of a company, but it also matches your internal talent to what you might need on specific projects. And they're a company that are neighbors yeah. to us right next door to where our, um, our, our temporary headquarters are. Yeah, they were previously known as Hourly Nerd, went through a rebrand and seems to be working. So <laughs> yeah. I want to know what the strategy is. Uh, I mean, what, why you say you many times have really lined them up with where GE is focused, as you say, in manufacturing, for example. Is this a potential yeah. M&A play in the future as these companies get bigger? Or is this seeing where the industries are going that you're already working within? It's both. And, and what we try to do is make sure that we stay at the absolute forefront of what's happening. It's sort of where are the unknown places that GE should be sure to keep their eyes on to make sure that we are absolutely understanding how those ecosystems are evolving. So we're very involved in really the future, the cutting edge, and exploring what those technology convergences might bring, must, might bring to the equation. And so we try very hard, and it's, it's not just for acquisition. A lot of um, corporate venture capital arms will tell you straight out that that's what they're trying to do. We do it for strategic reasons that involve both learning and also that al allow us to participate in the ecosystem, to understand where that landscape is going, to understand what customers are really liking and adapting to. So this strategy of being able to invest and to partner and to create new businesses within GE Ventures is something that we're pretty excited about. And it's not cheap, Sue, at the moment. We've seen some heady valuations. How are you finding the competition when you're trying to get your ins into some of these particular areas and some of these companies? Yeah, well, we are seeing valuations come down. I think you're going to hear that across the board with uh, a number of the venture capitalists, both corporate venture and financial institutional investors. But what I will say is the following. You can't depend on just being... Uh, differentiating yourself as a financial investor. Everybody has capital. So what we have to think about is, is really what else can we bring to the equation that really helps the startup and be differentiated in terms of helping them grow. So we think about the kind of scale that GE brings to the party, the kind of leadership development that GE is so well known for, and being able to offer that out to our entrepreneurial partners and the CEOs and the CFOs of the entrepreneur um, companies that we have in our portfolio. We also do it by thinking about what co-development activities might we be able to do with our respective startups? What might be able to do in terms of distributing their particular products? So we must differentiate ourselves, not only because we have capital and because we're nice people, but frankly because we can bring <laughs> a, a, a really differentiated uh, offering as it relates to the kind of things we can help them grow. So it's a win-win yeah. for both them and for GE. 
and a global opportunity for these startups if they do indeed leverage your platform. Jeff Bornstein telling me earlier, look, more than 50% of our, our revenue is from outside the US. We've got to think like a global yes. company. What, therefore, do you think of the global landscape of startups and companies that you're potentially investing in? Because how does Boston sort of stack up versus some of the other key hubs? Oh, Boston is, is undergoing a renaissance right now. It's, it's a remarkable place um, to be investing in, and we're very excited about it. Of the 100 startups that we've invested in, and GE Ventures is relatively young in terms of the GE 125-year history. We've only been around for about three and a half years. Of, of those 100, we have about 10 investments in Boston, and part of what is so incredible about Boston is it's the whole package. You have the universities, which pump out talent in really incredible ways, the top quality educational system. You have the entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is pretty mature now. It's one that really is healthy and vibrant. Then you've got a very healthy uh, venture capital ecosystem that understands the phases and the stages of being able to invest and actually grow the companies, not to mention a very what I would call welcoming and inviting government um, uh, relationships uh, sort of activities yeah. that's going on in Boston. So it's, it's really prime in terms of investing and quite differentiated from a number of different areas. <clears throat> so a, ten a tenth of investments are in Boston. What about Silicon Valley? How does that stack up? Give us an idea of where the portfolio splits because is Silicon Valley still the bigger brother? Silicon Valley is still the big brother. It's been there, it's going to be there for a while, but that's not to say Boston can't get as big. <laughs> so, and, and GE is certainly hoping to be right there in terms of catalyzing that, stimulating that, and partnering with the entrepreneurial ecosystem to do that. Silicon Valley has got some secret sauce that they've been able to master for quite some time. And I, I think that everybody looks to Silicon Valley and what Silicon Valley has done and is trying to mimic it all over the world. Boston yeah. has been around for quite some time and knows how to do this. And I think now with the kind of things that people want to invest in, this trend of going from tech for consumer to tech for enterprise, where you're starting to deal with these really hard problems, but yet using what we've learned in tech for consumer, meaning mobility and analytics, and being able to apply that to hard problems is really quite heady stuff. And it will be very important to the productivity of many different companies. And I think com for the competitive nature of corporate America, this is gonna be very, very important. And I think Boston is really committed to really building up that type of capability. Fascinating conversation. Sue Siegel, been great to get your expertise. The CEO of GE Ventures, thank you for joining us today from LA. Now, a few tech stories we're watching outside the East Coast for you in Europe. Uber has suffered a setback in its fight against being regulated as a traditional taxi service. An advisor to the European Union has rejected the argument that Uber is nothing more than an app. The opinion is non-binding, but it gives an indication that Uber might not be able to shake off national restrictions. Now coming up, GV, Alphabet's venture capital arm, has been investing heavily in life sciences and preventative healthcare. We'll take a look at their portfolio, including a new position in insurance startup, Clover Health. That's next. And we're also broadcasting on Bloomberg Radio, 1200 AM and 94.5 FM HD2 in Boston. And Bloomberg is the official broadcast media partner and co-sponsor of the Boston Pops Fireworks Spectacular, of course, on July the 4th. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology in Boston. Now, one venture capital fund has been making a splash here, and it's GV, that's Alphabet's venture capital arm, eyeing the biotech scene. Joining us now is general partner Krishna Yeshwant, who invests in life sciences and healthcare companies, not to mention your own background. I mean, Krishna, you're amazing. You're a physician, a programmer, an entrepreneur yourself, and not much you haven't done. Talk to us about the investment areas you're particularly excited about based here in Boston. Sure. Thank you for having me. Uh, in Boston, we're uh, clearly investing heavily in life sciences. So yeah. it's across the entire spectrum of healthcare. So, you know, therapeutics, you know, even if there's not an IT component, we'll do pure drugs, we'll do diagnostics, med tech. 
And then there's a lot of payer, provider, IT sort of uh, opportunities here. Anywhere where computer science touches any part of healthcare, that's going to be an area we're going to get involved with. Talking about payer provider area, we, just today we were talking about Clover Health. Yep. It seems to be a new investment of yours. You've gone in, it's now become a newly minted unicorn, no less, because yep. of the money, the 130 million that you've contributed to. What, like Clover Health, sets it apart from the others? I go back to the people who started it. So there's two very special people behind Clover Health, Vivek, uh, the CEO of the company, and uh, Chris Gale. Uh, so Chris actually was previously at Yammer. He's an mm -hmm. IT uh, person, just actually an incredible person. Uh, and Vivek has been somebody we've known through Flatiron Health, another of our large healthcare investments. Uh, it's very rare to be able to find a company that can really marry the healthcare insights that come from somebody who's been in the industry with really where IT is going. And the two of those people together, we saw it as being a very special opportunity. So it is really about founders and leadership. It's not about the idea to a certain extent, or how yeah. much, is that what sets it apart? If I'm a Boston-based entrepreneur looking to get some GV money right now, I have to be wooing you by the force of my personality and the experience that I have. You know, I, I find those two things go together. You know, uh, big ideas attract great people. Great, great people will only work on big ideas. And so uh, it's got to be both for us. Uh, but it's very rare that we find uh, somebody really great is working on something that's not uh, of the highest caliber. Payer provider is also, of course, exposed to political risk. We're looking at changes to the Affordable Health Care Act at the moment. How much do you have to look through these initial political uh, instabilities? You know, uh, any, any sort of venture investment is really uh, getting involved in a company at the very beginning. And these stories always take several years to really pan out. Uh, often beyond the scope of any given administration. So we're always looking at the fundamental changes that are happening in a space, and that's what we're really investing in. And, and so there are changes, you know, even, even four years ago there were other changes happening. Mm. Uh, we have to uh, look at the things that are going to be pervasive in any of these administrations, and that's, that tends to be the thing that we're really investing in. And at the moment, that is data meeting with health. Absolutely, with absolutely. But uh, but also, uh, you know, we're paying a lot for healthcare. Uh, are we getting enough for it? What are the things that we can do to increase the efficiency of uh, understanding diseases, of understanding what's happening in our healthcare delivery system, understanding how we pay for things? These are fundamental questions that are going to transcend any of the uh, immediate. Uh, political or, uh, or uh, payer uh, uh, shifts that we're seeing today. You're talking about seven, ten-year bets here. Yeah. What about those that are coming to roost at the moment? What about, we were just talking about valuations and GE Ventures feels that valuations are coming down and anyone would tell you that. Do you think they are and, and what about the exit areas for these sorts of companies you're investing in? You know, I, th I think it depends a lot on the different areas. Uh, we're very active as a venture fund. Uh, you know, so we're still seeing uh, a lot of uh, very robust valuations in, in parts of the market. I, I would agree that there are some parts where it's, uh, the froth is uh, cooling off a bit. Which parts? Uh, uh, you know, I think, I think some of the areas where uh, we've seen, uh, you know, some of the social media areas and things like that where, you know, the, we've seen the stories play out over time. So to snap events, Q1 numbers being so painful and seeing an IPO, yeah. like, does that hurt the IPO pipeline a bit? Does it put people off and wary of social media and internet companies? Perhaps in tech. I mean, I think, I think we've had the most robust tech IPO market in years uh, lately, so I don't anticipate that slows down. Certainly in the life sciences arena, we've seen a lot of IPOs recently, and I think we're just going to see more of that. There's great science uh, behind a lot of these companies, and just looking at the pipeline going in, I think we're just going to see a lot more great companies coming out. And what about your global... I, because of course you're sat here in Boston looking at the Massachusetts state, but how does it compare to what other hubs are producing when it comes to the life sciences? Outside of the US? Mm. Uh, so we spend a reasonable amount of time looking in Europe. Uh, so we have an office in London, we have uh, uh, two partners out there looking at uh, a variety of companies, both in tech and life sciences. We've made several large investments actually in the European uh, life sciences community. And, uh, we're not seeing that many investors there, and that's part of what makes us excited about it. A little bit less competition, always a good yeah. thing. <laughs> Krishna, it's been great having you. Thank you so much for joining us, and been great to be in your home city for the time being. GV General Partner Krishna Yeshwant joining us there.
Now, a story we're following for you. SoftBank is leading a 502 million investment in VR startup Improbable Worlds. That's a UK-based company which creates virtual worlds for multiplayer gaming and is also raising funds from Andreessen Horowitz and other investors. The investment comes as SoftBank finalizes its $100 billion vision fund with backing from Apple and Saudi Arabia. Now, according to Bloomberg Data, the Improbable Worlds deal ranks at the fifth largest UK venture investment in the past decade. Good timing for London Tech Week. Now, coming up, there's an arms race going on in the lucrative industry of warehouse robotics. We'll go behind the scenes of one Boston based startup. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to this special edition of Bloomberg Technology from Boston. Now, the disrupted force of e-commerce drove America's warehouse operators into the robot business. For decades, they were focused on shipping bulk products to retail locations. But online orders, on the other hand, require shippers to pack boxes with a diverse set of items and route them to customers' homes. That shift has given way to collaborative robots, in which a warehouse employee works alongside an autonomous machine. Bloomberg visited Massachusetts-based Six River Systems to see well, how one robot is making that job easier. Meet Chuck, an autonomous warehouse robot that helps employees fulfill online orders. Chuck guides workers down aisles and features a screen that shows where items are located, how many to pick and where to go to complete the next task. So at this point, the Chuck has stopped right next to the pick location that I'm looking for. So it's, I'm looking for pick location 06E05. Jerome Dubois is co-founder of Six River Systems, a Waltham, Massachusetts-based startup. The Chuck uh, is named after the Charles River. We're a Boston-based company and uh, very proud of our origins and our roots here. This is all part of a fulfillment solution for e-commerce, traditional retail, and third-party logistic companies. We've designed this as a collaborative robotic solution to be able to drop in and be used in any warehouse environment. It's definitely more economic than people alone. You know, the same person can now complete you know, two to three times as many orders during the day. And breaks down to about $30,000 per robot. But it's not just hardware. It is a cloud-based platform that also tracks data. And it took me 18.2 seconds to pick that item with 10 seconds of walking. Chuck, however, isn't alone. When e-commerce giant Amazon bought Massachusetts-based Kiva Systems in 2012, now known as Amazon Robotics, it ended the commercial sale of those robots that warehouses and retailers had come to rely on. The founders of Six River Solutions worked at Kiva. With the exit of Kiva, now Amazon Robotics, from the commercial marketplace, it left a void for a number of companies. A void that set off an arms race among next-generation robot makers. There's Fetch, a company in San Jose, California, and a growing number of Massachusetts-based startups like Vecna, Right Hand Robotics, and Lucas Robotics. It's a very significant market. E-commerce spend alone in this space is about a billion to two billion dollars. We know that there's a tremendous amount of money that's going into this market, and a lot of money being invested in automation, and, and we're hopeful to get you know, a, our percentage of that. Six River Systems has raised nearly $7 million in funding to date and plans to double its number of employees to 35 by the end of the year. Now, as we wrap up day four of our coverage in Boston at GE, I want to head back to Emily Chang in San Francisco. Emily, we got some real insight on the investing climate in this area compared to Silicon Valley. It seems that Silicon Valley is still the big brother, but around the rest of the globe, it looks as though Boston is stacking up. Caroline, it has been lovely to watch you this week. I have learned so much about what is going on outside of the Silicon Valley bubble. Really appreciate all of the stories that you've been bringing us. Tell us what you have on tap for tomorrow. Plenty, plenty as ever. In fact, we can geek out entirely at Mass Robotics. It's one of the fastest growing startups in the city. Of course, I'm hoping we get to get our hands on some of those robots we might be seeing driving around. We'll also be speaking to the CEO of DraftKings, CEO Jason Robbins, and TripAdvisor CEO Stephen Kaufer. Both companies based right here in Boston. Both companies we need to keep an eye on, Emily.
so much going on in Boston. Caroline, thank you so much for sharing us, sharing these stories with us this week. We're looking ahead to that one more show tomorrow. Uh, and that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. All episodes, of course, live streaming on Twitter. You can check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV weekdays, 5 p.m. in New York, 2 p.m. in San Francisco. That is all for now. That's all from San Francisco and Boston. This is Bloomberg.